Hi, I'm James, and if you've been a visitor to our channel in the past or a subscriber, you'll know that a lot of our videos are upgrade guides for laptops, and uh, if you do have a question about a specific make and model of laptop and whether it can be upgraded, drop it in the comments below and we'll do our best to answer that. But increasingly, you will find that modern laptops are a lot like this one, where although we have an upgradable SSD hidden in here, memory is actually soldered down to the board. And why is that? Well, let's take a look. So if you go back in time, laptops used to be large bulky things like this old Dell, which is an absolute monster. Laptops were typically built around almost desktop components. So in this hand I have a laptop Pentium 4, and in this hand one from a desktop. And what we can see is that other than the fact that the desktop has a heat spreader on it, they are more or less identical. They are both socket 478, they both have the same pinout, and other than a few little caveats like the, um, the mobile chips had speed step, an early form of that, and the desktop chips didn't, you could put a laptop chip into a desktop board and it would pretty much work. So one of the key changes in laptops that we've seen over time is that they have certainly got a lot thinner. And with, with those Pentium 4s you had quite a lot of heat requiring big coolers and everything else. Obviously technology has improved all through these systems in terms of integration, um, but one of the real driving factors was probably this, the Pentium M. Uh, this was, while not the first mobile focused architecture, certainly one of the first really popular ones. And this allowed for thinner laptops because you had a more efficient processor, uh, more efficient cooling was therefore possible, and also you started to get greater integration of things like graphics into the chipset rather than requiring a separate graphics card. The real inflection point for this was probably actually the first generation of MacBook Air, which was famously drawn from a manila envelope at its unveiling. Uh, this brought a really thin, light system, um, which had a dramatically reduced number of ports and, to quite a bit of criticism at the time, featured a customised uh, soldered down version of the Marom Core 2 Duo chip, along with a mere 2 gigabytes of DDR2 memory, which was also soldered down to the board. So whilst from some corners it drew criticism for its lack of upgradability and repairability, really the engineering goals that it had of reducing thickness and reducing that mainboard size for maximising battery space can be seen in not all but most laptops that we see on the market today. With the second generation Penryn Core 2 Duo chips, we see these soldered down versions being offered to laptop manufacturers in general, not just Apple, and by the time you get to the fifth generation Core i chips, so the Broadwell generation, uh, the socketed mobile processors have gone completely, and with it basically the ability to upgrade your laptop's CPU with anything other than a mainboard replacement. So that's the processor, but what about memory? Well, at the same time we start to see some changes in how memory is laid out on a mainboard. So here we have an older sort of core fourth generation system, and we see our memory is two SODIMs which are effectively stacked on the board, so one on top of the other. But of course this is adding uh, height to your socket, and we're trying to get rid of that. So, as a result, we start to see some different approaches in how memory is laid out in your laptop. So here we have an example of one uh, approach. So here we still have two SODIMM slots, but they're laid out side by side on the board. Sometimes you would see them arranged the other way, so it's back to back. Um, and this obviously then lets you reduce that socket height, but the downside is you're now doubling up the amount of real estate that you're taking on your board for it. For a large sort of 15 or 16 inch laptop like this with quite a big main board, that's possibly acceptable, but when you're designing a 13 or 14 inch machine, it's probably not a compromise you can make. So particularly in smaller and lower end devices, we increasingly start to see what's called memory down designs. So this was, instead of having a SODIMM slot, um, instead uh, soldering that memory directly onto the main board, and this obviously reduces footprint where you don't have to spread out your two uh, DIMM slots on the board, and also thickness because you don't have that height of the slot and the two stacked PCBs, instead the modules are straight onto the main PCB. What you did often see for a while, in particularly in some of say like the Lenovo idea pads, I noticed it quite often, was you would get a kind of halfway house design where you would have some memory down on the board and then you would have a SODIMM slot for expansion. 
Obviously this gives you some PCB size benefits, but still gives you the additional Z height of the sodium slot. This does however mean you get some flexibility in your build configurations and upgradability later on, so was popular in some devices. But besides PCB size and Z height, there's been another drive towards soldered down memory in laptops, and that is the use of low power or LP DDR memory. The LP variants of DDR uh, allow for both lower operating voltages and higher frequencies. And these are a big win when you're trying to advertise laptops based on improved battery life, but also give increased uh, bandwidth at the expense of some additional access latency, which generally in the laptop space is a worthwhile trade-off because it benefits your graphics performance, uh, particularly as you get more powerful integrated graphics cores, um, and this is great for you know, general graphics performance and gaming. But because of the signaling requirements and operating at these higher frequencies, you don't find LPDDR5 being integrated into SODIM modules. It's simply not really possible to do it. Um, because you get so many benefits around the lower power usage, higher frequencies, uh, the PCB space savings and everything else, it really isn't practical to create a SODIM based laptop for many markets. There's simply too many advantages from using LPDDR5. It's also worth saying from a manufacturer's point of view, upgradability probably isn't a major driving factor in the laptop sale. It might be something that someone considers later, but they probably don't look into it at the time of purchase. You could also make the argument that it's not always in the manufacturer's interest to make these things easily upgradable. It's something which allow someone to extend the laptop's life versus potentially buying a new one. So with the continual push for smaller PCBs, higher speeds and lower power consumption, it kind of looks like the end of the line for memory upgrades, right? Well, enter LPCAM2, a relatively new standard allowing for LPDDR5X to be fitted as a replaceable module. And it's not just a theory, it's already here in laptops like the Lenovo ThinkPad P1 Gen 7, which uses it to offer up to 64GB of LPDDR5X. These modules integrate the full 128-bit wide memory onto a single small PCB. So rather than having to have two SODIMs to support dual channel, you're fitting it all onto a single module. And this screws down onto the mainboard and allows for more optimal routing and gives both a smaller footprint and minimal additional height when compared to SODIM modules and a socket. Now this isn't something you expect to see in all future laptops. LPCAM2 still adds additional cost with the module and complexity to a design and in most consumer laptops the trend is still likely to be for smaller, lower cost option of soldering down memory to the mainboard. For markets where repairability and upgradability are a key consideration, however, let's say your typical business orientated laptops and workstations like the ThinkPad P1, uh, at least it gives some future options. And these are the kind of machines that can make a great second hand purchase at three or four years old as well. So I hope you found this interesting. If you'd like us to look at more trends in how laptops have changed over time, then do let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you found this video interesting, do hit that like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more from us in the future. Thanks for watching.